Hey guys, Dr. Sill here, junior registrar um, working in mental health and psychiatry in, in Australia. And uh, I'm on an after hours shift right now, but uh, we've just had a huge wave of work and now it's like kind of the calm after the storm, I guess. Um, and I thought I'd take the uh, a second to kind of talk about psychosis. I thought I would just make a video, talk a little bit about how I conceptualize psychosis. Um, some of the medical students and um, patients and their families have found it helpful. Um, I'll try and go into a bit of depth. I think, uh, you know, it's something that is not completely understood, but if we kind of understand the depth of our understanding, you can kind of know where the, where, where the uh, limits of our knowledge are. I think talking and trying to understand psychosis is extremely important. Psychotic illnesses um, cost society incredible amounts of money. They ruin lives if they're not well treated. Um, psychosis can be really, really debilitating, and it feels horrible for the people suffering from it as well. The paranoia, the the auditory hallucinations, it's it's, it's terrible. And so it's um, something that we want to try and understand so that we can better treat it because currently the tools for treating it um, aren't always that effective and sometimes have side effects. And, and if you understand the kind of biochemistry and the neurobiology around what's happening, you can sometimes choose better tools um, based on the symptoms that you get. If you're interested in uh, mental health videos, please consider subscribing to the channel. Um, I make regular videos about mental health content and leave comments down below if there's anything you're interested in me talking about. But yes, I'm not a consultant psychiatrist. I'm I'm in training to become that. So um, make sure, you know, this is not medical advice. This is just uh, educational purposes only. So talk to your doctor if you have any specific questions. But if you have general questions, leave them down in the comments below and I'll answer them. So uh, the structure of the video is we'll talk about what psychosis is, what it looks like, and then we'll talk about some of the theories around um, what happens in psychosis, we'll talk about the different neurotransmitters involved, we'll talk about dopamine, glutamate, and also serotonin, um, and we'll talk about also you know, the genetic neuroinflammatory and uh, uh, structural changes that you see in the brains of people with psychotic illnesses. So let's begin. So what is psychosis? Look, uh, as someone who works in an acute uh, inpatient uh, high security uh, mental health facility um, in psychiatry, we see a lot of psychosis uh, uh, and it's uh, often involuntary care that we give because people with psychosis can sometimes not have insight into their psychosis, which will make sense once you understand more about what is involved in psychosis. Um, but there's different ways to kind of conceptualize it. The, the kind of one liner that you hear is it's essentially a problem with understanding reality. Psychosis is really someone whose experience, subjective consciousness and, and, and experience is not based in uh, the real world um, and it, it is having some problems in the processing of, of, uh, of sensation and generating internal perceptions uh, that aren't based on external realities. Uh, so let's break that down a little bit. Um, there's lots of symptoms that can be considered psychotic and and they include, I guess a way to categorize them are positive, negative, and cognitive. Um, the positive symptoms are things that are like um, uh, uh, hallucinations. So hallucinations is having a perceptual experience, you know, hearing, seeing, touching, tasting, feeling. You're having this perception, but without the sensation. Okay. Like you, so you're hearing, but there are no, there's no sound. All right. There's no if if you if you put a microscope on the ear, on the tympanic membrane, on 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 the part of the ear that transduces um, kind of uh, a, a physical stimulus like the um, movement of air that make that's that you have in sound that you're hearing right now. Uh, if you looked at the ear, it wouldn't be moving, but the person's experience, the brain would be hearing. And that's a hallucination, as opposed to an illusion, where, um, where, where, which is a different thing, and where you do have a sensation but you misinterpret it. Um, uh, so, for example, um, they they might hear uh, air conditioning going, but they'll the, the sound of the air conditioning they'll interpret and hear it as uh, the devil speaking into the ear, saying nasty things to them. That's an illusion, and that's not necessarily psychosis by itself. Um, but having a hallucination is is one of the symptoms of psychosis. Um, and uh, and the most common ones you get with like a schizophrenia, and we'll talk about the different kinds of psychosis, but uh, a kind of primary psychotic mental illness, uh, the most common 
uh, ones you'll get auditory hallucinations as opposed to like visual hallucinations which you might get more like dementia or in intoxicated states if you're doing psychedelics or if you're withdrawing from drugs then you get more visual hallucinations so those are the hallucination side of things of the primary symptoms the other primary symptom you see is um delusions fixed false beliefs uh that are not consistent with someone's cultural background uh really sometimes out of the blue odd there's lots of different types of delusions but the most common ones you see uh in in mental health facilities are paranoid delusions they feel followed they feel unsafe they feel like they're going to be attacked sometimes they have to attack to defend themselves um which is uh you know dangerous because they might attack someone who's not threatening them but they interpret them as a threatening person because uh, it's delusional and, uh, and, and there's no way you can change a delusional person's mind about a fixed um, delusion. And, uh, and the other, other common type of delusion is grandiose. So they might have a belief that they are God or that they are um, very, very rich and that they have very important work. Or, you know, uh, these, are, these are two types, but there's many other types of delusion. You can speak for hours about delusions. Um, and, and so that's another positive symptom of psychosis. The negative symptoms of psychosis are things like, um, you know, they call them the, the A's. So the anhedonia, a lack of emotional range, a kind of flatness, um, avolition. So a lack of motivation. You can just sit in a chair all day and stare at, you know, listen to the radio and do nothing else, um, and be happy staying in the room. Um, uh, yeah, so social withdrawal, not seeing people as much, uh, uh, and allogia, a lack of speaking or spontaneous speech, which re represents um, kind of thought processes. Uh, so that's the negative symptoms. And then cognitive symptoms are that, that people with psychosis tend to have cognitive side effects like uh, problems in their IQ. Uh, it does seem to affect attention and focus and, and cause distraction. So um, those are the kind of symptoms you see. So what's going on? Like what, what is happening in the brain for someone to have problems in, um, in, in, in psychosis? Well, what medical students are trained in and what doctors have been kind of saying for the last couple of decades is that it's all around dopamine. And I think it's fair to say that the common end um, point of uh, psychotic processes is probably a, a, a you know, mesolimbic um, hyperactivity uh, and the mesolimbic circuit has um, lots of neurotransmitters involved in it but mainly it's, it, there's a lot of d2 dopamine receptors and it looks like um, when they are hyperactive you that correlates to the symptoms you see in psychosis the positive symptoms sp specifically so when you have a hyperactive mesolimbic uh, circuit uh, which goes from the base of the brain and the brain stem the that's the uh, meso part of the mesolimbic word and that's from the ventral tegmental area for the medical students who need to memorize this stuff and it goes all the way up to the uh, ventral striatum in the basal ganglia and that's the limbic part of the mesolimbic circuit uh, and it goes into the nucleus accumbens there um, uh, the, that hyperactivation is, is is what's relating to the symptoms you see in positive symptoms and we know this because of a lot of different kind of types of research but really uh I, you know, if you if you give someone a lot of dopamine, like dopaminergic drugs, so if you give them stimulants, if you give them methamphetamine, if you give them L-dopa, you can you can trigger psychosis, you can cause psychosis. And oppositely, if you block D2 receptors, you can mute psychosis. You can reduce the sim those positive symptoms. Uh, and, and that's really how it's described by a lot of people with psychosis. It's not so much that you're um, stopping the the voices or um, removing the delusions, but you're turning down the intensity. You're reducing the dial um, of the intensity of the auditory hallucination so that instead of someone screaming in their ear, it's a whisper in the background. Or instead of um, them being completely preoccupied with needing to um, you know, destroy the pedophile cult uh, that their boss is involved in, uh, which might have been the delusion, instead of, them, instead of that happening, it's, it's quieter, it's in the back of mind. But then you've got to ask yourself, okay, this is the common endpoint. What are the inputs? What's triggering the mesolimbic hyperactivity? Uh, and then that's when things start getting very complicated very quickly because uh, the, the mesolimbic circuit starts in the meso area. It starts in that uh, ventral tegmental area in the brainstem. And that area is, in, is innervated by 
all these different circuits uh, and the important ones being um, uh, serotonin circuits from the raffi nuclei going to the ventral tegmental area. And uh, now more recently, we're finding out there are glutamatergic circuits also coming from the cortex down into the uh, brainstem. Now we know serotonin is important in psychosis because the most effective drug we've got for psychosis is actually mostly a serotonergic blocker rather than a dopamine blocker. That's clozapine. Uh, but uh, we don't have much uh, drugs focusing on the glut glutamatergic uh, circuits, but there are some in development and that'll be very exciting when they come out. And uh, what's happening there is is if it's very complicated again because there's inhibitory neurons with NMDA receptors on them and they think that there's a problem in that NMDA receptor that being um, dysfunctional. And so if you don't have inhibitory neurons that are working normally because they've got a dysfunctional receptor, then you don't have the normal healthy inhibition of the glutamate pyramidal you know, cortical neurons. And so you have hyperactivity of all these neurons and that's sending messages down into your brainstem, which is triggering your ventral tegmental area to then send messages through to the nucleus accumbens, which is making you have all these um, symptoms because the nucleus accumbens connects to all these different areas as well. Um, and also that ventral tegmental area also connects to the cortex and a bunch of other areas. And, and so you're getting all this, the symptoms you see because of this hyperactivity. And the studies that kind of try and understand this are really looking at imaging, like fMRIs and SPECT, uh, single uh, photon emission to computerized tomography imaging. Um, but like the fMRI imaging we're using that can show activity of brain areas, the highest level of detail it can get is one cubic millimeter, one voxel. And in one cubic millimeter, you can fit I'm pretty sure hundreds of thousands, at least tens of thousands, but probably hundreds of thousands of neurons. So you know, the brain is incredibly complex with such elegant, uh, minute, like minute details. And our tools for understanding it are like not like very little finesse, you know. So, so there's still so much un uh, unknown about the brain. But as we learn more about the different circuits involved in psychosis, um, we can you know, choose better drugs based on the symptoms you see. So there are currently drugs in development that focus on the glutamatergic kind of side of things. There are drugs in, um, that are available that focus on the serotonin side of things, on the dopamine side of things. I guess another question you might ask is, well, why? You know, you should always ask why as many times as you can. And why is there this this abnormality in in the brain, uh, in these neurotransmitters we've spoken about? Well, um, the thinking is that there's, you know, you know, it's environment and it's genetics. Um, and uh, genetics is just evidenced by the fact that if you have an identical twin with schizophrenia, your risk of having it is very, very high. Uh, and uh, and if you have a first degree relative with schizophrenia, it's very, very high, um, much higher than the general population. Um, and the environment, you know, we do see higher rates of schizophrenia in um, you know mothers who were in, uh, who were pregnant during famines or high stress environments, uh, people who have uh, you know, hypoxic brain uh, or complications at birth. Um, and, and things like that. So ob there are these obvious and clear uh, correlations to environmental stresses that um, are related to the development of this um, this disease. So, I mean, the way that I conceptualize what's happening, uh, and this is just my kind of hypothesizing, is that when you have genetic vulnerabilities and you're, you know, um, having environmental stresses, which is influencing what genes are being expressed. You know, that's what epigenetics is, that the environment triggers which genes get expressed. Um, these genes are getting expressed, uh, getting expressed in such a way that the mapping of neurons in the fetal development is abnormal. So normal fetal development, there are all these supporter cells which lay down the maps for the neurons to lie down in the right Way. That's called you know, neurulation and neural development of the fetus. Um, and, and there are very critical stages in, in that process. Um, but if you have these abnormal um, proteins in the glial cells and in the neurons and they're being mapped incorrectly, um, uh, then you're going to get these symptoms. A a and then you might ask, well, why don't you see the symptoms in, in a one-year-old or in a toddler? Well, that's because, you know, up until the age of six, you make you have an abundance of, new, of synapses. It's just so many synapses. And then from six, you get pruning where those synapses get uh, removed and you get strengthening of the most important synapses and this the the problems in the receptors and in the pathways that have been laid out uh, only really come apparent in your teen years 
um, and and often people can think and often people think of psychosis as a problem in synaptic formation or, or a synapse. So the synapses between neurons are weak, uh, and that might relate to you know why it's so hard, you know why there might be IQ and cognitive problems in people with psychosis. There have been lots of other kind of imaging and neuroinflammatory findings. So um, on on postmortem autopsies of the brain, they found less inhibitory into neurons in different parts of the brain. And you can imagine if, uh, for example, in the hippocampus, if you have less inhibitory neurons in a part of the brain that's involved in memory, then you might uh, believe in memories a lot more strongly, and that might be what a delusion is. Uh, this is just my speculation, uh, but I can imagine that if you have uh, you know, no negative inhibition of um, neuronal firing in your hippocampus, uh, which is a very important structure in brain formation, that that might relate to the kind of neurobiology of what a delusion is. But um, thanks for taking the time to listen to this video. If you found it interesting, uh, leave a comment, like the video, share it with a friend. That's the ways you can support the channel. I wish you all a wonderful day. Uh, and leave any comments, uh, questions down below. I'm keen to answer them and I'm keen to make more videos. Um, as a little update on my personal life, I've just bought a, a house. Uh, and so that's why I haven't been making videos because I've been trying to um, sort all that out. And I'm looking forward to moving in in a month. And that means that uh, we'll have a YouTube studio and we can make much more regular videos. Um, and if you want me to react to any content, uh, send the links in the comments below as well, because I like kind of doing commentary as well. All right, guys, all the best, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.